Uh, I'll be talking about uh, dynamical air correction for encoded quantum computation. Uh, there is a uh Lots of overlaps with what you've heard already, uh, especially with what uh, Leonid was just talking about. So I'll just uh, start a little bit from the basics. This is the outline. Let's just skip it. So the goal is usually to perform a desired unit operation on the system. But well, what you get is neither unitary nor desired. One of these. Is it good? Can you hear me in the back? Not well. Well, there's uh, another one. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what you get is neither unitary nor desired. And it's just because of the errors that we've been hearing about. And uh, in this setting that I'll be talking about, they relate to the always and undesired terms in the Hamiltonian, such as qubits coupling to the environment or the coupling terms among the qubits in the system. Well, this should remind us uh, as a responsibility as a, physici as a physicist that if there is a fight between you and the world, back the world. And this is not a quote by a great physicist. Okay, so let's just start with the usual Hamiltonian description. Take your control Hamiltonian and think of the ideal unitary that you want to generate, say, a logical rotation R with an angle theta. Very simple setting. Well, the actual Hamiltonian is not your control Hamiltonian. It's this Hamiltonian that we've been seeing a lot these days. And you actually get this bare unitary for the everything, everything uh, propagator and you'd have to trace out to trace out the bath to obtain the state of the system. Okay, it's just a, just to remind us what these things are. The, we have the control Hamiltonian which acts on the system and is supposed to be perfect. We have the error Hamiltonian that couples the system and the bath. And we have the bath's own Hamiltonian. And let me call these the sum of the bath Hamiltonian and the system Hamiltonian, uh, the control system Hamiltonian, uh, the secular Hamiltonian. Okay. Well, we need to do some approximations. Here's another quote. This is by a real physicist. Uh, well, this is about renormalization theory, so we don't care about it. Okay, so we take the interaction picture of the secular Hamiltonian and try to write our propagator as a product of the interaction picture uh, of the secular unitary and the error unitary. That's how we define the error unitary. And the Hamiltonian for the interaction picture is just this. And let us define an error phase with phi er, which describes the phase you get after you do this propagator. Let's just define it like this. And I know it's not unique because you're taking the logarithm, but let's stick to this. Okay, and we can obtain the error phase from a Magnus expansion, which is this. So the first term is just an average uh, Hamiltonian. The second term is a bunch of commutators. There are other terms, which I haven't written. And our goal would be to minimize the error phase, to minimize the errors. Because if the phase is zero, then new error would be identity, and we would get the ideal evolution. So here's just a quick notation that I'll be using. Uh, I usually use J to refer to the strength of the bare error Hamiltonian, and beta is some measure of the batch mixing power plus this uh, control Hamiltonian. So these are related to the previous talk. If you remember, uh, Leonid was adding um, the two uh, frequencies of the logic gates and the basket uh, and the bath. Okay, so let's just say a few words about the Magnus expansion. So Magnus expansion is absolutely convergent as long as the strength of the Hamiltonian that goes inside it multiplied by the total time for the evolution is smaller than pi. And I think uh, Lorenzo used one there, but it's pi, which is, of course, consistent. Well, you don't need a discretization for this unless you want it. So you could discretize your evolution, but then uh, it's not necessary, really. You just have to go to the higher orders. And it's always unitary because you, uh, you are approximating the Hamiltonian, which is going to give you a unitary operation. And it truncates nicely. That is, if you just ignore the higher order terms, they would just be given by some uh, factor a factor and a power, which is nice.
But it's very hard to calculate to higher orders and because the number of terms grows exponentially, of course. And uh, this, you can find this more on this on this paper, which is called Expansions That Grow on Trees. And if you want to get really deep, uh, go really deep on this, there is this paper on the archive about the relationship between stuff that solves differential equations and Hopf algebras and uh, more mathematical goodness. Okay. So one of the uh, things that uh, we recently found, which I think is kind of obvious, is that whatever you do to your system, whatever unitaries and controls and things that you apply to your system, you would get an error phase, an effective error phase. And the norm of this error phase is always going to be smaller than the original bare error Hamiltonian. Kind of makes sense. But uh, you could think of this as, okay, let me I'll just give you a proof sketch. We use the Thompson's theorem, which is this. If you have two products, you can, uh, two product exponentials, you can write it as a new exponential, and then C is related to A and B like that, and then just use a discretization, and uh, drag your phi error like that, and just use a triangular inequality. And of course, restrictions apply to the interpretation. And you don't really have to buy this from me. But when you uh, interpret the effective uh, error as a phase, this phase could also have parts that act on the system, that it could also have parts that act on the bath only. So it's not, so phi error is not going to be purely of system times bath form. So you need some, a little more to get this into a real error. Okay, so here's your quantum circuit. You could replace it with an ideal circuit times an error, which are these uh, shaped lines. And the effective error is just going to be a little smaller than the, or just the same as the above. Now, here is another inequality that we recently found. When you are comparing the fidelity of an operation with an ideal one, you could write the fidelity as one minus this Two, two error sources. The first term is just the error in your control, that is how well you can manage to get to what you want without any, without the presence of the, in, in the absence of the bath. And the second term is the error due to the environment. So the, uh, the phi error comes back in. And that uh, norm is a trace norm, I guess. Okay. And we'll just fo focus on the error phase. Okay, let me just give a very fast review of dynamical decoupling. So we've been hearing about this. Dynamical decoupling is supposed to cancel the error phase up to the first order in the Magnus expansion. There are variations like randomized decoupling where you apply just random set of pulses that are supposed to cancel the uh, error phase by a uh, random averaging. We heard about concatenated decoupling, where you make new sequences by uh, recursively. And there's another decoupling that I want to mention, which is, I call, uh, I think it's called, now it's called URIC uh, dynamical decoupling, which is designed for spin boson systems. And um, it's very efficient. And what are the, there are other variations uh, when you want to mod do multi-qubit decoupling or recoupling when you have a bunch of spins and they are interacting and things like that. Okay, so one thing that uh, it's probably too, uh, not so right to say right now after Leonid's talk is that generic decoupling that is supposed to cancel our, all errors is for quantum memory. And it's by itself it's not directly suitable for co correcting quantum operations because if you just have a system you want to cancel all the undesired evolution, you will also cancel the desired evolution. But it's more, uh, this is a, maybe this is not a, the right thing to say, anyways, because you, you actually use decoupling to engineer uh, quantum operations. Anyways, let me just give a quick order by order expansion from, for decoupling. So you could write the propagator for the error propagator as a, as a unitary generated by this Hamiltonian, which is a time dependent Hamiltonian. Those DI operators are the decoupling operators. H, R of T is our friend, the error Hamiltonian. The T denotes the interaction picture. So up to the first order of magnitude, you just have an integral. Because of the time dependence, you get, the, you get other terms 
other than the first uh, sum. And for the second order, it is something like this. Now, this is zero by the decoupling condition. This will just go away. So we will be left with the other ones, which will not be zero. And these, the second order Magnus terms are kind of uh, bad because they can contain terms that look like the circular part of the Hamiltonian algebraically. While the first order Magnus term is just the, it will be a linear uh, transformation of the error Hamiltonian, so it will behave algebraically the same as the original error Hamiltonian. So those terms, the uh, first order terms, could be used again for higher order decoupling, while the second order terms could ha be potentially troublesome. Okay, so here's just a quick uh, uh, graph I'll just show. When you want to compare different sequences for decoupling, here's uh, what we suggest that you, you do. Uh, first of all, you have to fix the duration of your experiment when you're comparing diff different sequences. Well, and then you have to min um, specify a minimum pulse width, you have to specify a pulse interval, and you have to specify your coupling strengths, your secular Hamiltonian strengths, and let the sequences be chosen based on the above. Well, this, these are obviously the source of the error. The pulse widths, you would want to make this either zero or do some pulse shaping to avoid uh, unwanted, uh, unwanted transitions. And of course, you want T-long to be as long as possible. Um, so this pulse interval is, a, is, a, is an important resource for computing in general because it specifies how fast you can vary your Hamiltonians. So if you can make this pulse interval very, very small, then you can expect lots of good things. So obviously you, you can't make tau very, very small. So this uh, 1 over tau is going to be a resource for your computation. Okay, here is just a simple FIDLT simulation that I did a couple of nights ago, just comparing two sequences with the same, uh, so these are all in the same total duration and different uh, interval times for two different sequences. You see palindromic concatenated and palindromic vanilla, which is just repeating a palindromic sequence. And palindromic sequences are symmetrized sequences that can be read, uh, which are the same if you read them from left or from right. So they, are time, they have a time symmetry and they work uh, more nicely. Okay, so let me just go over to the, I, I guess, the main part. So uh, as Leonid was talking about, uh, what, almost talking about the same thing, I think exactly the same thing, uh, when you want to combine uh, an encoding with time called decoupling, you want to make sure that the, the control uh, Hamiltonian for the encoded operations commute with the decoupling pulses. So that you could seamlessly blend these two. So your quantum operations are going to do the job and the decoupling operations will reduce the errors. Um, and you could even top it with measurements to get more quantum error correcting uh, code goodness. But, okay, that sounds nice. But seamless is just a word. As uh, you know, as uh, Leonid was saying, you, you have, you'll have to exactly manage where to apply your operations, when to apply your pulses. So it would be very nice if you could just say, I'm going to apply this control Hamiltonian over this period and I want to uh, apply my pulses whenever I want to. Okay, do it. <laughs> it turns out that arbitrary high fidelities are much harder to obtain uh, as uh, in compared to the quantum memory case, which was the original decoupling. And you will get errors that scale like j squared lambda t long, which are like uh, per gate errors. And these are not easily correctable up to higher orders. So one way of dealing with these things is to reduce the strengths of the logical operations. So for example, th think of an adiabatic quantum computation that is encoded. And also assume that you don't care how strong your adiabatic Hamiltonian is going to be. So you might be able to reduce this lambda because you need to uh, just go from an initial Hamiltonian to a final Hamiltonian. So it doesn't matter how strong these Hamiltonians are going to be. So that's another suggestion. But the problem with uh, adiabatic uh, computing and com combined with uh, dynamical decoupling is that the adiabatic Hamiltonian is going to be time dependent and that immediately presents uh, problems for decoupling. But uh, the problems 
for combining adiabatic quantum computation with decoupling are going to be related to the derivative of the Hamilton of the adiabatic Hamiltonian, which is supposed to be a small anyway. So let's see what we get. Okay, before we get to just just go quick, let me skip this. Just look at these things. Okay. So here's the cat form code. I, this is the name I made for this. I'm not. So you, your logical zero is uh, the cat state for uh, qubits. You are encoding uh, n physical qubits into n minus one logical qubits, and those are your logical uh, poly operators that you you can use to make other states with the other cats. And just assume a single qubit, single uh, single body error Hamiltonian. That, that's those are the Paulis. SIO alphas and B alphas are the bath operators. And the uh, what we call the universal decoupling sequence works for this. If you use the encoded, uh, if you use the if you use um, collective uh, X and Z pulses. So let's go. Okay. So one of the side results of what I'm going to show is that it, you better get a better computer for your simulations because I'm going to use a two qubit dojoza the adiabatic version of this, which is at least quantum, because one, one qubit version is not quantum. Uh, but I'll be using many body Hamiltonians, or someone should teach me what they do in this paper with gadgets, where they, where they use two, uh, two body Hamiltonians. And we encode that into four physical qubits, and I have a miserable bath with just one spin. And uh, here's just the setting for the simulation. And here's what we get. So I'm uh, dividing my total evolution, uh, total uh, experiment time into different intervals, and I apply different uh, decoupling sequences and see what I get for the fidelity at the end of the day. And what I haven't graphed here is that this fidelity will not go as well as uh, we want because it's just going linearly, and that's not so great. It's okay, I think, but it's not so great. So that's almost it. And here's the stuff that I didn't talk about, which are, I think, very interesting, such as pulse width issues. And the interval synchronization is very important because I think it is probably the most important problem in decoupling because you need to adjust your intervals to be all the same. And that's, yeah, it's uh, nice to say in theory, but I, I'm not sure if you could do it for very narrow, uh, for very small intervals. So that goes back to our ability to control the Hamiltonians. The other thing that uh, I, is another side result is that you will get a lamp shift on the bath because the effective Hamiltonian for what, that you get from higher order Magnus expansion will actually contain terms that are pure bath, which I'm not sure how to interpret them. Does it really mean that you're heating up the bath or, okay, because we're not in a thermodynamical uh, picture. We're just using Hamiltonians. So I'm not sure if I can interpret it like that. I didn't talk much about decoupling and recoupling multiple spins. I didn't say anything about real higher order generic decoupling because concatenated sequences are not real higher order. They're uh, somehow renormalized higher order. So we don't know what to do there. We are working on it. And I didn't really say how, the, uh, how to blend QECC and uh, dynamical decoupling because uh, they use different uh, pictures for representing, for mathematically representing stuff. So we, we are thinking of applying Magnus expansion to QECC so that we can combine it with the dynamical decoupling. So that's it. Thank you very much.
about it. So let me show you.